16. Um, we're going to look at um, Jesus' impact on the people around him during this very dark hour where he faces the Garden of Gethsemane and his arrest and being denied and betrayed by his friends and so on. It was a pretty rough time that Jesus was facing. Now if you've got your, um, your notes, your news sheet, you'll find in the middle uh, a little outline of today's five headings. Uh, and we're going to look at five points through uh, the message today, uh, which hopefully will show us something of who and what Jesus had an impact on, like our Newton's cradle image up there on the screen. Now, first of all, straight away in John chapter 18, John sets the scene of Jesus' imminent dark hour. He says when, when Jesus had finished praying after the Last Supper and so on, Jesus left his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley to the other side where there was a garden. And it was in that garden that Jesus was sorrowful but strengthened. And that's our first heading that I want to consider um, today. Now, when John writes his gospel, he sometimes puts in these little details that we can gloss over very quickly and very easily. For example, why do we need to know that he crossed the Kidron Valley? It's almost like we've been given Google Maps route finder for Jesus. And I wonder why John felt it was important to include that little bit of information. Well, it's because straight away, Jesus is, is identified with the Old Testament character of King David. This is really interesting. When you start to delve into scripture, you find everything that Jesus went through already prophesied or acted out in some way in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures. And in 2 Samuel and chapter 15, we, we read a story of King David at the point in his life where Israel was beginning to reject him as the king and turn their attention to Absalom instead. And you can read that story for yourselves later on because it's quite a big chunk of, of scripture there. But this is what happens. Um, the, the messengers come and tell David that the hearts of the people... Um, uh, people of Israel are with Absalom and not David any longer. So David says, look, we better get out of here. Let's, let's clear out. Uh, and we must, we must move quickly. And verse 15 says, the king's officials answered him, your servants are ready to do whatever our Lord the king chooses. And there's a parallel here with Jesus and his disciples because the disciples say, we'll do whatever you want, Jesus. We'll follow you even to death if necessary. And we're told that the king then set out with his entire household, leaving some people to take care of the palace and he took some people on his journey with him out through Jerusalem to the edge of the city. And again, there's a parallel because at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus leaves some of his disciples to watch and to pray whilst he goes on a little bit further to seek the Lord. And one of the followers of King David said, as surely as the Lord lives and as my Lord the King lives, wherever the King may be, whether it means life or death, there your servant will be. Doesn't that sound a lot like Peter? One of Jesus' closest friends who said, well, I'm not going to betray you, Lord. I'll follow you even to death if I have to. And Jesus says, really, Peter? You're going to deny me before morning comes. And the whole countryside sort of followed David on this journey that he was taking. And we're told in Samuel's story that, that the, the people wept as, Jesus, as David uh, exited the city. And the king crossed the Kidron Valley and all the people moved on towards the wilderness. Where did David go when he crossed the Kidron Valley? He went to the Mount of Olives. He trod the path that Jesus would also tread. He was the king of Israel, rejected by Israel. Jesus was the king of kings who had made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem where everyone hailed him as king and then rejected his kingship. The followers of King David said, we'll go with you, we'll do whatever it takes. And then they wept. Jesus' disciples too, we'll commit to you, Lord, we'll do whatever it takes. But then Judas betrayed him 
and Peter denied him. And in the story of Samuel, again, verse 30 says, But David continued up to the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. And all the people were weeping as they went too. Jesus followed the same journey, the same pathway that King David had taken hundreds of years before him. And he arrives on the Mount of Olives in a very special garden. Luke adds the detail that, as usual, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to pray. And we know what happened from from the other Gospels, other than John, that, that Jesus left his disciples to pray, went on a bit further and fell down and prayed, God, Father God, if you're willing, let this cup be taken away from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. This was a place of sorrow for Jesus. This was a place of of stress and pressure and anxiety. And Luke says an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. So although Jesus was sorrowful, he was strengthened in that garden. Isn't it interesting that where mankind's problem started was in a garden? And the choice that was made in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve was to disobey God. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus made a choice to be obedient and to choose God's way and to say, yeah, Lord, I kind of don't want to do this, but not my will, your will be done. And Luke adds that being in anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus' darkest hour happened in this beautiful, peaceful and familiar place. But man's problem of disobedience and sin, the decision made in the first garden, was reversed in this garden because Jesus chose to endure the sorrow and the suffering. Matthew adds in his gospel that Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not your will, not my will, but your will be done. And he prayed it again. Now it's interesting that we note here that Gethsemane means oil press. And you can see the kind of situation that was involved there. Either men pushing the stone around, the wheel around the stone, or a donkey doing that hard work. And Gethsemane, this place of pressing and crushing, is a place where Jesus, under such intense pressure and sorrow and stress, sweat drops of blood. Jesus was about to be well and truly crushed. But let's note that from the crushing flows the oil. You know, the oil has, olive oil has so many uses. It's used in cooking, it's used in healing, it's used as the oil in a lamp. But unless the olives were crushed, the, the oil couldn't flow. And Jesus allowed himself in that place of sorrow to experience great pressure to be crushed so that the oil of the Holy Spirit could flow through each one of us. What a choice he made. This week, Margaret Francis came to the office and uh, knocked on my door and said, oh, I've got, I've got a little present for you. Oh, great, thank you, what is it? And it was, um, it was a big jug full of freshly pressed pear juice. She'd been out to Middle Farm where, you know, you can take your fruit and have it put in the press and made into juice. And you have to have an awful lot of fruit to get a small amount of the juice. But, you know, you can only get that juice once the fruit has been subjected to that pressure. And we benefit from the oil and the flow of the Holy Spirit because of Jesus' decision to allow himself to be pressed and pushed and crushed. He was about to be betrayed, arrested, bound, beaten, denied, rejected, abandoned, interrogated, wrongly accused, unfairly tried, flogged, mocked, judged, crucified and buried in a borrowed tomb. 
Hum humanly speaking, in his humanity, Jesus did not want to face this dark hour. Think about it. He was a 33-year-old man. He had everything to live for. And yet he chose to face the pain and the agony, being overwhelmed with sorrow. But he chose God's will, not his own. He surrendered to whatever the Lord God wanted as an outcome. We know from the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 53, that very profound passage that speaks of the man of sorrows, that, that Jesus would be the one pierced for our transgressions. Jesus was sorrowful to the point that he sweat drops of blood. And we know it was actually quite a chilly evening because Peter warmed himself by the fire. Jesus wasn't sweating because of the heat. It was because of the stress. I wouldn't want to drink that cup, I'm sure, in my weak humanity. What was the cup that he kept talking about? It was the cup of suffering. It was the cup of God's wrath being poured out for sin and judgment. And Jesus chose to have that and to drink that himself so that we don't have to. He chose to be our substitute so that we can be freed from the penalty of sin. This was indeed a dark and sorrowful time for Jesus, his darkest hour. But Jesus is the light of the world. And Frank in her diary wrote, look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. Whilst the darkness was pressing in all around Jesus, he was the light that shone and overcame the darkness. And our first impact, if you like, through this chapter is the impact that Jesus, the light of the world, has on the darkness. He makes it disappear. And Isaiah, in his prophetic paragraph, went on to say in verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. I'm sure when Jesus was sorrowful and the angel came and ministered to him, he was strengthened by that. But I'm sure what strengthened Jesus in his darkest hour was this just absolute sense and certainty that through what he was going to do, light was going to overcome the darkness and he would see the light of life. He would be the light of life and he would, he would invest that life in each one of us. And that's what gave him joy. We're perhaps familiar with the scripture that says, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame. In his sorrow, he was strengthened. So we'll move on and, and consider how Jesus was also arrested, but aware. Aware of what? Aware of his identity. He knew exactly who he was. He was aware of why he was here. He was aware of what was about to happen. And he was aware that only he could do that. And if we read John chapter 18 verses 12 and 13, we'll see the impact that Jesus had on the soldiers around him. Verse 12 says, The detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. These soldiers who had been sent, we're told it was a detachment of soldiers. Now, a detachment in the Roman army would have been anything between 200 and 500 men. Yeah, isn't it interesting? We think in the garden, oh, well, there were, you know, the, tw the 12 disciples minus, minus Judas, because he'd gone off to arrange this arrest. So um, there's only a few of them, and perhaps a few blokes came and arrested Jesus. No, they brought a detachment of Roman soldiers, hundreds of them. But look earlier in the passage, look what happened and the impact that Jesus had on them. Verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, aware, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Verse 6, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Imagine that, it must have been like dominoes, mustn't it? 200 plus big burly Roman soldiers, 
Just because Jesus said these little words, I am he. Whoa, that revelation absolutely floored them. Why? Because this was Jesus identifying himself with the great I am. All through John's gospel, we have all these statements and they're on our beautiful banners. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. But in this moment, in his darkest hour, when he was being arrested, Jesus was so aware of who he was and what his purpose was and who his father in heaven was that he could just say, I am. And they all toppled like dominoes. 200 soldiers flat out. Wow, what an impact. Very powerful little words. But Jesus in this moment identifies himself with the great I am. The I am who spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Which led to the deliverance of all the Israelites from the slavery in Egypt. Wow. Jesus was super self-aware. He knew who he was. He knew where he'd come from. He knew where he was going. But he knew what he was here for in this dark hour and the men seized him they arrested him uh, and, and we know that Peter you know got carried away with the moment and lashed out with his sword it's really interesting little details isn't it in the bible it was it was the guy's right ear now that meant one of two possibilities either Jesus uh, Peter was facing the man and he was left-handed and he chopped off his right ear or he crept up behind him and chopped off his right ear with his right hand. It's interesting, these little, little things. And Malchus, the name Malchus means right ear. Isn't that interesting? So all these things were, were kind of very detailed. And Mark picks up on this and he says, you know, Jesus said, every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts and you didn't arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Everything about Jesus' suffering, death and resurrection is prophesied and fulfilled in great, great detail, which we'll look at more in a moment. So uh, if you can't read that, that's a basketball game going on there. It says, during a lively game of pick-up basketball, Peter denies Jesus three times as the goalkeeper, <laughs> denies his goals. But our third heading here, Jesus was deserted and denied, but was decisive. Isn't it awful when in your weakest hour it feels like everybody's abandoned you and forsaken you? Maybe in your moments of weakness or frustration or sadness, whatever you're carrying, you just think, I'm just going to ring so-and-so. And then you ring their number and it just rings and rings and rings. Oh, how sad. And it's not that they've deliberately forsaken you, they just might happen not to be there at that moment. But it's tough when you face darkness and you feel so alone. Jesus' friends had already fallen asleep while he tried to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Why was that the case? Because the flesh is weak. Jesus noted that. He said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is oh so weak. And human support is fantastic, it's great. But let's be honest, it's just not always available when we want it. And in the dark night of the soul, it's you and God, just as it was Jesus and his Father. <coughs> now in John's Gospel, again in verse 8 here, we're told that Jesus asks the men who have come to arrest him to let the other guys go. He said, I'm the one you want, so let them go. Let these men go. But Mark has a slightly different kind of slant on the story in his gospel. And he says at this point, everyone deserted Jesus and fled. He even adds the detail that there was a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment who was following Jesus. And they seized him, but he fled naked from the garden, leaving his garment behind. It's kind of a bit cartoon-esque, that, isn't it? <laughs> You know, just trying to grab him and he runns off. You can see him just running off in his boxer shorts. <laughs> Actually, totally naked. There was a violence and a, and a kind of grabbing 
chaos at this moment. But this young man fled quickly, and many scholars say that was probably Mark himself. And he's just putting his, his part of the story into the big package of all the Gospels. But Jesus' arrest had a massive impact on each of the disciples, perhaps in different ways. And actually, that poem that we take the expression, the dark night of the soul, from, by St. John of the Cross, a 16th century Spanish poem, it talks about the darkness of not being fully united with God or not experiencing God's love. And Jesus had this dark hour where he was deserted and denied by Peter three times, we know that. But he was decisive in that he stuck to what he said he would do. And he says to Peter, when Peter tries to wade in with his sword, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? He was decisive about the decision that he'd made to follow the Lord. And isn't it interesting, there's this lovely contrast in in John's writing. You've got Jesus saying, I am he. And then... When, when the servant says to Peter, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? He says, I am not. <laughs> and we very much are, I am not. I'm not strong. I'm not as focused. I'm not as decisive. I'm not as committed. I don't want God's will as much as my own at times. And yet, Jesus gives us this fantastic example of being absolutely decisive despite the dark hour. Fourthly, in this, in this intense time, Jesus was interrogated, but he maintained his integrity. And in verses 19 to 24, we see the impact that this whole time of interrogation had on the religious Jews. Jesus was bound and taken to Actually, not the high priest that year, that was Caiaphas, but he was taken to Annas, who was his father-in-law. He was kind of, he'd been a high priest, and he kind of kept the title as a bit of a chip on his shoulder, you know, well, I was high priest, you know. He's kind of high priest emeritus. But he didn't have the right to question Jesus like Caiaphas would have. And Jesus was bound and interrogated by this man. But Jesus was still absolutely in control. He didn't respond with violence. And here we have the image of Jesus' hands bound and also a lamb that would have been bound. Remember, all of this took place in the context of the Passover festival where all the Israelites would have been remembering with the sacrifice of a lamb how they'd been delivered in the time of the Exodus by putting the blood of the lamb over their doors and their homes, so that the angel of death passed over them. They couldn't see it. They just couldn't grasp that they no longer needed these sacrificial lambs. And there would have been thousands and thousands of sheep slaughtered during that festival as an attempt to sacrifice and atone for sin and to remember this great Passover festival. The lamb was bound. And these lambs also would have probably come from the hills of Bethlehem, where we know early in Jesus' life, the shepherds had that sense that this baby who was born in Bethlehem was the Lamb of God. And Isaiah writes, he was oppressed and afflicted. Remember, this is hundreds of years before Jesus was walking on the earth. Such an accurate description. He was oppressed and afflicted. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so Jesus didn't open his mouth. How amazing that through the Holy Spirit, God could reveal all this stuff hundreds of years before Jesus even walked on the earth. Remember as well, the one who right at the beginning of John's gospel is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Later on in John chapter 10 says, I am the good shepherd and I will lay down my life for my sheep. He was the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, but he is, is the good shepherd. He kept his integrity 
in the face of questioning. He didn't resist and fight, but he chose to go where he didn't want to go. When he was questioned, he said, why are you questioning me? They wanted to hear it from Jesus' own lips that he'd been saying he was God, that he was somehow blaspheming and all these kind of things. And Jesus said, ask everybody else what I've been saying. I've been, I haven't hidden anything. I've been preaching in the synagogues. I've spoken at the temple. If you need a witness to convict me of some wrongdoing, ask them. He was treated so unfairly, but he doesn't say anything to Annas, the, the high priest. And he, you know, he's, he's struck for his seeming insolence. Jewish law couldn't prosecute without the evidence of witnesses. And Jesus said, go get them. And they couldn't find any. Imagine the impact that this encounter with Jesus had on those religious leaders. Everything that they stood for was being questioned. The impact of Jesus fulfilling all those Old Testament prophecies and being the Messiah meant that their whole religious system, their livelihood, their corruption was all about to collapse. Wow. That's some impact for Jesus to make. In a very dark moment, the light shone very strongly. And then before Pilate, Jesus was tried, but he remained true. And this section, uh, I'm going to read it to you. We, it, we left off at verse 27, and I'm going to pick up at verse 28. Because here we will see Jesus' impact on Pilate, on politics, and on power. So reading from verse 28. The Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor, by now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they didn't enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. What hypocrites. What absolute hypocrites. They, don't, they wanted to be ceremonially clean. They wanted to kill the man. They wanted to kill Jesus, but they didn't want to upset their Passover meal that they'd planned. Verse 29, so Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against him? And they said, if he weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves, judge him by your own law. And they objected, we have no right to execute anybody. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. And I just want to pause there for a moment. Because Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen. And I just want to focus on Psalm 22 for a second. This is a psalm of King David, the rejected king of Israel. But these could easily be words that Jesus would have spoken on his crucifixion as the rejected king of Israel. Imagine Jesus saying these words, I'm poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. You know, that crucifixion, apart from the pain of the nails in his hands and feet, quite often their shoulders and bones would be pulled and dislocated. My heart has turned to wax, it's melted within me. You know, when those soldiers took the spear and put it in Jesus' side, and blood and water rushed out, and I'm told that that's the sign of a rupture of the heart. His heart was melted. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. On the cross, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. You lay me in the dust of death. They did. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. And the, the Hebrew word for dogs is goyim, which is also the Hebrew word for Gentiles. Gentiles surround me, and a pack of villains encircles me. Those are the Roman soldiers. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can't, I can't imagine the agony of that. And again, this detailed piece of scripture, these words were written hundreds of years before the Romans had even come up with crucifixion as a means of execution. Jesus knew 
exactly what was going to happen. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And we're told that the Roman soldiers gambled at the foot of the cross for who was going to have Jesus' clothing. Wow. John says, this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. He was going to be lifted up on the cross. He was going to pour out his life unto death and be numbered with the transgressors. And you can read in Isaiah 53 the whole of that passage. It's coming back to John's Gospel in verse 33. Pilate went back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? He's on trial. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then Pilate responded with his famous question, what's truth? And with this, he went back to the Jews, gathered and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Wow. Pilate tried him, but found him innocent of any charge. And we know that then he said, shall I release him to you? And they said, no, give us Barabbas instead. What shall I do with this king? Crucify him. And Pilate kind of has this play of power going on. Because you can kind of sense that he doesn't really want to hand Jesus over because he's quite challenged and interested in him and and, and finds him quite fascinating. But the Jews twist it and say, look... Anyone who says that this man is the king is not a friend of Caesar. And it's then that Pilate kind of twigs and thinks, ah, yes, if I let this man be king or acknowledge him as a king, my position of power is under threat. I'll be killed for treason against Caesar. So where Pilate is weak and indecisive and and, and kind of doesn't know who to please and what to do. Jesus, even in this dark hour, is true to who he is, why he's come, and how he's going to die. And he stays strong, resolute, and focused. Then we know that Pilate said, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll have him flogged. And then they cried out for crucifixion. So what can we kind of glean from all of this? Let's have a look at Jesus in his darkest hour and be impacted afresh ourselves. Jesus, in this moment, faced his sorrow without his friends. You know, we're we're blessed to be in the family of God. We can support one another. But there are moments where human support isn't enough and we feel very isolated and alone. But in those moments... God himself will send comfort from heaven and we can be strengthened in our sorrow by the sense of purpose and destiny and hope that even in our weakest hour, God has good plans for us. Even if it doesn't seem like it right now, God will always have your best interests at heart. What can we learn from Jesus? That he he chose God's will above his own. Sometimes that's hard to do because we're like the disciples. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is very weak. You know, and we end up in that same kind of battle that Paul talks about. You know, there's good things that I want to do and I don't do them. And the things that I don't want to do that I shouldn't do, I end up doing. And there's this battle between the spirit and the flesh. But Jesus chose God's will and pursued that above his own choices. And we need to learn to surrender to God's will. He was aware 
aware of who he was, what he was doing and why he was doing it. When I was a youngster, one of the most profound um, pieces of wisdom, I suppose, that, that a, a dear friend, a youth worker from America shared with me was simply this. He said, um, always ask yourself, why do I do the things I do and who do I do them for? Why do you do the things you do and who do you do them for? And that piece of wisdom and advice has stuck with me throughout uh, my, my maturing process. And every now and then I just stop and take stock and say, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Who am I doing it for? Let's be aware of why God has, has brought us to this point and say, okay, Lord, why am I here? What, what's it about? Jesus didn't resort to violence in his darkest hour. He could have done. There were swords around. But instead, he stuck to his type, to character, and he brought healing in the garden to Malchus and his poor old ear. You know, sometimes when things are dark for us, we want to retaliate, we want to fight. I know when I'm sat in traffic, tapping my toes, tapping the steering wheel, and somebody cuts me up or something like that, the road rage rises up and I... Oh. But no... Well, it's hardly a dark hour, is it? <laughs> just, just rush hour. But in our darkest hour, we need to make sure that we keep peaceful and maintain the character of Christ. He suffered great injustice, but he maintained his integrity and peace. He fulfilled all those prophetic words of the Old Testament and his own word that he would lay down his life. Nobody took it from him. You know, there's this big argument, isn't there? Who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? Who, who's responsible? Jesus laid down his own life. No one took it from him. Even Pilate said, don't, don't you know I've got the power to release you or to hand you over? And Jesus said, well, you've only got the power that my father allows you to have. He remains completely in control. He chose to lay down his life. It wasn't something that was kind of a cruel act on God's part. Jesus chose to be our sacrifice and he stayed strong and resolute in that purpose. How? Why? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy set before him? Look around the room. We're it. Wow, doesn't he get the rough end of the bargain? <laughs> but for the joy of seeing us in relationship with himself, of us being the light of the world like he was the light of the world, of us being salt and light, of relationship with him, of eternity with him. Those were the joyous things that kept Jesus going. So although he was in sorrow, he was strengthened. What an amazing and awesome sacrifice Jesus made for us. And in his darkest hour, there's so much we can learn from him. And boy, oh boy, should we be thankful. Thankful that he was so resolute in his decision to endure the cross for our sake. Thankful that we can learn from him about maintaining our identity, character, integrity, peace and purpose through our own dark times. And thankful that though at times we may find ourselves alone, God is the one who brings us comfort and strength. And we've, we've got a joy set before us as well. We have the hope of Jesus' return and the resurrection. How awesome, how mighty. Let's pray.